Well, welcome back, everybody. This is uh, our last session of the day, but it, it's a good one, and we get two exciting speakers. First, we're going to have Julie Beagle from the Estuary Institute. She's the Institute's deputy. By the way, I like I, don't, I hate saying SFBI. I, I like calling them the Estuary Institute. Doesn't that sound better? You know, you know, but. Well, anyway, anyway, but Julie is the Deputy Program Director for the Resilient Landscapes Program, and she's been leading the charge on, the, on climate change, sea level rise related analysis, particularly in the formation of the most recent Adaptation Atlas. She's an expert in both uh, fluvial and uh, in tidal geomorphology, and she's both an environmental scientist and an environmental planner. Go Bears, because she got her master's from Cal. Go Bears. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for hanging in there, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. I think this is my first RMP meeting, um, and I'm really excited about this integration. So the last session really set up this talk really well, thinking about how do we bring together the water quality issues and also the fact that we need to adapt our shoreline and we'd like to use nature as much as possible. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project um, that was funded by the Water Board um, and has become interesting to other people that haven't funded it, and that I think is a good thing, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll talk about that. So I'm going to briefly discuss the actual tool. It's called the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas that we released in May of this year. Um, a little bit about methods and kind of what the tool is, um, but also really focus on new directions. We have second phase funding from the Water Board to integrate a lot of the findings with the water quality issues that the RMP takes up. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the applications of the Adaptation Atlas in the last six months, but also um, moving forward. So as a snapshot, the Adaptation Atlas is a tool. It's a place-based framework um, that's meant to help the region adapt to sea level rise with a real focus on nature-based strategies. Um, it was really clear to us starting a few years ago that there is a lot of guidance about riprap, about seawalls, about gray infrastructure. And gray infrastructure is going to be really important, as was mentioned last in the last session. There's less guidance on the science, on there's less availability for where can you do horizontal levees? Where should you do beaches? Uh, we know a lot about tidal marshes in this area, but there's a whole host of other nature-based strategies that we know will be necessary for adapting to sea level rise. And so the purpose of this was really trying to guide, to provide some guidance for that front, because we feel that nature-based strategies are going to be more resilient, they may cost less, and they have multiple benefits that we care about as the Bay Area. Um, and the third thing that this report does is it asks folks to span their jurisdictions. It asks you to look to your left and your right and upstream and downstream and think about who's around you. We know we need to plan together, so it's asking uh, our shoreline and our watersheds to plan at the landscape scale. I like to start with this image because I think it just says it all in one picture about why we need to plan at the landscape scale, why we need to think about our neighbors, and why this is not just a water quality issue, an environmental issue, um, this is everybody's issue. This is Highway 37 um, in the 2016-2017 water year. I don't know if you remember, it was closed for six weeks. That means people going from Vallejo to Marin, it's the only way across the top of the bay, could not tr uh, transverse this route. Um, and this is another view of that same spot. You can, <laughs> it's sort of amazing that that's State Route 37 crossing three counties, a national wildlife refuge, um, it's Caltrans Highway, um, we can't solve, one of those groups can't solve this. We need to work together. And we are working on this, but this is going to be replicated in many, many places in the Bay. Um, we like to say, and we've seen this come more and more, you are hearing this, sea level rise is not going to stop at jurisdictional boundaries, at city boundaries. Um, we don't have help right now in working cross-jurisdictionally. I want to give a shout out to the BRIT, which is the cross-agency uh, group that's working on trying to streamline permitting, but we don't have a governance structure that supports this. We each have our own property, our own mandate. Um, we're not mandated to work at this scale. Um, and the reason this matters is if each city, each county, each landowner goes it alone with sea level rise, um, the folks with the most money and the most resources will be protected and that will have knock-on effects in other places. And so it's a real equity issue. This starts to include everybody. Um, so we're attacking this from our little geomorphic and ecological um, position in three major steps. And the first is asking our uh, Bay Area to plan using what we're calling nature's boundaries instead of traditional boundaries. The second step is trying to identify where nature-based strategies can be the most appropriate. Um, and the third is bringing people together around 
um, these units around this issue to try to get towards something, a resilient future. So what do we mean by nature's boundaries? Um, the very popular term operational landscape units is what we mean by that. Um, these are areas that we have defined through this process um, which have shared geophysical and land use characteristics that we think are, are suited for a particular suite of strategies. And that what happens in one operational landscape unit affects the rest of it. So we really need to figure out what those units are and how do we work together. Um, they're connected hydrologically. They tie to watersheds. They're essentially the bottom parts of watersheds. Um, watershed planning, we like that. We've gotten on board with that. What happens to watersheds when we get down to the flat, really modified parts of the built environment? We lose that. And so this is trying to put our arms around what does the hydrologic connectivity mean with sea level rise towards the bottom of, the, uh, of our baylands. Um, and it it's everybody that's influenced um, by, by sea level rise. This takes the H++ scenario, which is the really extreme one from the 2017 OPC guidance. Um, and so it's taking a really broad look at who and what lands are going to be influenced by sea level rise. Um, and it doesn't care if you're a dredger or if you're a landowner or if you are uh, a wealthy city or not. It just looks at where you sit in relationship to the fault systems. Where do you sit geomorphically within this bay that we live? Um, so we've divided up the bay into three major zones based on that land water interface. Headlands and small valleys, you know that. In Marin, there's deep headlands, there's deep water. Different set of strategies make sense there than um, Here's a picture of the deep headlands. You can, you know that a marsh off the, the a deep water um, is not going to make a lot of sense, as opposed to a look down Santa Clara Valley. This is a big, wide alluvial valley, more sediment. This is where there's space for sediment, um, space for marshes, um, and and some areas have land that goes into shallow water and deep water. It's not rocket science. It's just using the physics of this place to try to assign suitability for nature-based strategies. We then characterize them. Um, we have a lot of data produced by the RMP, produced by everybody, everybody in this region, looking at the differences in tidal range, wave energy, um, what the shoreline is composed of. Also, um, to the last, to the point of the last panel, um, where do we live? Where do people live close to the shoreline? Where do people work close to the shoreline? That's what you see in right and red. If you just look at the red in these two maps. Um, and then we're trying and we're starting, and I think that's why you've invited me here today, is to think about um, infrastructure and how does how do wastewater treatment plants, how do the highways, how does the infrastructure that is largely along the shoreline of the bay interact with this and how can we use nature for everybody to adapt. So step two is identifying what types of strategies make, might make the most sense uh, where and using as much nature as you can. Um, you've all seen the blue maps. We've done a great job in this region so far at looking at our vulnerability to sea level rise. It looks like blue on the map and you're kind of in the blue or you're out of the blue. Um, that is less important in a lot of ways than why you're in the blue. Um, this, it really depends around the shoreline, kind of how, what our vulnerability, what's the source of our vulnerability. This is one of our classic uh, berms that we see. It's kind of a pile of sediment and rubble. Um, this is what wave overtopping looks like. A lot of places in the bay, our vulnerability, the reason you're in the blue is because of wave overtopping. That is really different than this is uh, downtown Martinez when Alhambra Creek ca captured it. A lot of the flooding comes from the backside. That's a really different set of uh, strategies that will solve this problem. Um, you know about king tides, water coming up and staying. We're going to see that more and more. And groundwater. So there's different directions, different sources of that vulnerability. And so we're trying to pair the right type of adaptation strategy with the problem. Um, I don't know that I need to tell this audience, but I like to stop for a second and say, what, what are the benefits of nature-based adaptation? Um, they're multiple. Clean, we know that they filter water. There's flood risk management benefits of nature-based strategies, um, benefits for wildlife. We've already invested a ton in that. We think they cost less. There's more and more research coming out that says that these solutions will cost less and be more adaptable over time. And as a region, we have come together and agreed that we would like to continue to uh, restore marshes. We think that this is really important for all of these benefits. And we've set targets, we're reaching towards them, and folks mentioned that in the last panel. But Javier, when you said you loved beaches, that was so exciting to me because I also love beaches. And I think it's worthwhile to think about the rest of the suite of nature-based strategies, including beaches. We have used to have 27 miles of beaches around the bay of different types of sediment. So when we think about pairing the right types of sediment to the right spot, thinking about where sediment's gonna stay in place, where are beaches gonna stop marshes from eroding, 
where are, where can where can beaches help to slow down the erosion and the and the wave energy that we know will increase with increased storms? We have a couple examples which have been really great. We need more of them. We're working with Marin County and the Coastal Conservancy right now to build a couple more. Um, and here are some other examples of nature, the types of nature-based strategies that I'm talking about. Living, uh, living shorelines like oysters, eelgrass, horizontal levees. Um, there's a whole list, which is right here, which we examined for this report. So we started with the subtitle measures and we went all the way up into the watersheds. We're working on that part, um, thinking about what, how do we assess the suitability of these nature-based strategies. Not which we want to do, but what we could do. Where, where are the physics there to support the sustainability of these types of strategies? We also work with SPURS, this is just an aside, which is a think tank in San Francisco, looking at some non-structural solutions, policy, regulatory, and financial tools that are also possible. I'm not going to talk about that as much today, but I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, so for each of these nature-based measures, um, we created a set of criteria. How wide, how high, where in the tidal frame they need to be, what elevation they need to be at. Um, and here's an example of that. So for marsh restoration, you know, we know a lot about this. We know where there are marshes. But there's a lot of places that are at the elevation to be marshes that aren't. And that, um, and so we identified in green where marshes um, are suitable. That's between mean sea level and kind of the highest astronomical tide. Um, and then we assessed, given the wave conditions in that area, how wide would that need to be to knock down waves to about a foot? And so we set criteria like that. It's not engineering guidance. It's more filtering the set of strategies that may be suitable in this area. Um, interestingly, Saltworks comes out as a marsh. A lot of places that are currently slated for development, we have in green because they're at that elevation. We're not making a judgment. It's just what the elevation says. Um, Another example of this, when Javier was talking about migration space and how we want marshes to be able to migrate. So we looked at identifying where around the bay are the elevations suitable for marsh migration. They're not in the tidal, um, they're not at tidal elevations right now, but they will be with sea level rise. And so those are shown in, in uh, yellow and orange. Some of them are protected, some of them are unprotected. And so this allowed us to say, where are areas that we could buy? We can make decisions as a region um, right now to support that type of marsh migration over time. So we did that type of analysis for lots of nature-based strategies. It comes out kind of very spatially specific. Um, and then we created a suitability ranking. So for each of the operational landscape units, there are 30 of them. You see them going down the left side here. Um, we have a little menu in a lot of ways. Um, the nature-based strategies are along the top and we've ranked their suitability. So if it has a dark circle, those are strategies that would probably work in that area. If it has an open circle, it's maybe less appropriate. Of course, you can engineer whatever you want. We're trying to give guidance about what types of strategies make the most sense given the physical and ecological processes that are at play in these areas. Some of the strategies that we haven't looked at that we're looking forward to oh, working on more um, are what was mentioned last time, the potential to reconnect creeks to balance to deliver sediment directly. So we have a lot of work regionally about that, but how do we integrate that as an adaptation strategy um, to make the most of that sediment that's available? Another is green stormwater. So we don't often think about green stormwater infrastructure in the same discussion as sea level rise adaptation, but it is, it's all connected. And so um, trying to look at, this is um, an output, one of kind of the intermediate outputs of the green planet tool from SFEI, um, and the water board, but trying to look at where could green stormwater be effective. And this is just a first cut, but these are the types of questions that we're continuing to ask um, that have multiple benefits, both for water quality and for water attenuation with climate change. So the tool looks like this. Um, it's a very spatially explicit map of each of those operational landscape units that shows what types of strategies are suitable there. I want to Stop. It's not a plan. This is often talked about as a plan. This is just an opportunity map. You could do all these things. That doesn't mean you should, depending on the goals of this area. Um, these are some, these is a filter down set of, a, of measures that might make sense there. So in a place like Brisbane, um, you know, the elevations are, are fairly high. So things like beaches, oysters, eelgrass make a lot of sense there. This contrasts greatly to the Napa-Sonoma valence. And this is going back to that same area that I showed at the very beginning. 
um, where here you have a lot of subsided valens, we call them polders. Um, there's lots of opportunity for marsh restoration that's already going on, but here is where we have that availability to buy land to have marshes migrate into. And so each of these operational landscape units has a different suite of opportunities um, that could be put together into a strategy. This isn't a strategy, it's just an opportunity map. The idea is that you put these string these together um, and uh, kind of create a strategy that moves upslope. So here's putting oysters, gillgrass, and a beach that protects a road. For example, it's just a hypothetical. Um, here's an example with mudflat augmentation and a creek to bale and reconnection um, with a marsh, with uh, buying that migration space. So you can see the idea that you put these together to create a plan and then you phase that over time. And so this is what we are calling adaptation pathways where you think about what do you need to do first? Um, what are your opportunities first? How long will that last you? And what are some of the triggers and thresholds that you need to respond to um, that make you make a different decision? So first you could do a beach and a marsh, but um, at a certain point, water levels are gonna get too high. And so when do you have to start thinking about acquiring land, creating a transition zone, adjusting land use, for example, in, in the later in the century? Um, we're really excited that um, we have some funded next steps. There's a lot of directions that this can go. Um, one of the key things is bringing together a lot of the discussions that we've been having today. Um, my colleague Scott Dusterhoff and through an EPA grant is looking at um, the availability of sediment from the watersheds. How much sediment do we have? What's the supply and demand? And how do we match that with the availability of nature-based solutions at the shoreline? There's a lot of places we could do this. Do we have enough sediment? How do you make those trade-offs and priorities. Um, as I said before, our key task is integrating the infrastructure. We know that that's where we need to go, and that's why I'm really excited to be talking to you all today. Um, what are the implications between these measures? What are the water quality implications of putting a marsh in a place that we know is contaminated? Uh, we haven't thought through that yet, and we're really gonna need to bring all of these streams together. And then the other thing we're doing in phase two is thinking about developing those adaptation pathways in a couple of these OLUs as an example. Um, another exciting project that we are working on that's kind of in the same vein for next steps is working with BACWA and, um, and SFEI and the Water Board, and then there's other work going on with SFEP and UC Berkeley, um, looking at the opportunities for nature-based uh, wastewater treatment at POTWs around the shoreline. What approaches are most important, uh, applicable and how can we integrate that um, at the landscape scale? And so that's kind of our role coming into that project. Um, I want to hit slightly on a, a little bit on step three, which is how have how has this been used and how do we bring people together around these operational landscape units? Um, we had two pilot projects going on in San Mateo and Marin County where we actually brought stakeholders together around these units just as a test case. Does this work? Someone said in the last session, we need new ideas. This is a new idea. Let's try it. Um, we have this is a new problem for our region. Um, and I think we need to try new things. So we had a couple workshops looking at um, trying to create scenarios using the work that came out of this report. Um, so it's been a toolkit around shoreline unit, units. Um, it's also meant to help with environmental review with project uh, applications, um, guidance for developers. Um, it's also been useful in some of the policy changes that was mentioned before, both with the base fill policy um, out of BCDC and also the water board. Um, I think I'm right on time. You can download the report here. Um, but I also just wanted to say that um, the purpose of this is to be useful. We're being asked at multiple scales to think about how I just got a call from SFO yesterday, shocked that SFO wants to talk about nature-based strategies within their operational landscape unit. Um, so I think it is making sense and I'm really interested to talking more uh, to you all in this audience about it. So we have an interactive map and I also am here representing a very large team. I'm very grateful to the funding of the Water Board um, and the support of many people in this room and my team at SFBI. So thanks. Obviously super exciting. So I'm sure there's some thoughts in your head, some potential questions. Don't forget them. We're gonna have opportunity for a dialogue. But at the end of the session. But before that, we get to hear from from a, a new kid in town, but uh, Dr. Melissa Foley. I call her a new kid because she's been with us for less than a year. She's now the R&P program manager. So for the last 10 months at the, at the Institute, many of you may recall uh, Phil Trowbridge. She's replacing Phil Trowbridge, who was our 
program manager and who had very big shoes to fill. Boy, you know, but girl, you've done a super duper job. I can I can attest to that. Yeah, and it, and it just 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 highlights some things from you know, you know, part she's a you know, she's a marine ecologist, but but she claims, and I attest that I see her doing this well, works across disciplines to connect science, people, and management. Keep it up, girl. And uh, and so a lot, you know, a lot of lots of experiences, uh, including working at USGS, and she got her doctorate at UC Santa Cruz. So go banana slugs. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so this is it. You've made it to the end. Um, not, not, not quite. We're getting there. <laughs> um, so uh, I was just going to start by introducing some new faces to the RMP. Um, first, me. Uh, so as Tom said, I've been at SFEI and the RMP for about 10 months. Um, I'm an ecologist and have worked in, in a broad range of systems and a broad range of issues um, from dam removal to ocean acidification to ecosystem-based management. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and to be in this space where science is informing management. The other new face I wanted to introduce is Dr. Liz Miller. Uh, Liz joined us in May and uh, will be doing the toxicology work and developing that program uh, for the RMP. So we're really excited to have Liz on board. Uh, first, I'm going to go through the, some 2019 RMP highlights. Uh, first, I wanted to highlight, uh, so the, the theme of this meeting is pollution pathways to the bay, and I just wanted to demonstrate how all of our work groups are contributing to science for these different pathways. So I'm just going to throw out some arrows here to, to give you a sense of, of how these studies are, are specific to these different pathways. Um, and now we're going to, I'm going to go into a lightning round of updates, uh, from each of these, from each of these workers. So starting with the microplastics, as a couple of uh, speakers today have alluded to, uh, last week we wrapped up, um, a three year seminal study that is unprecedented, um, anywhere in the world really of microplastic abundance in San Francisco Bay. And microplastics were measured in the surface water, sediment and fish, as well as in two pathways, uh, wastewater and stormwater. As Alicia mentioned, stormwater it was the major uh, pathway, 300 times more microparticles and microplastics coming from stormwater than wastewater. And microplastics were everywhere that the team looked. And in some of these matrices, in, in particular surface water and sediment, had the dubious distinction of being the highest concentrations of microplastics measured in any study to date. Uh, one of the other things about this study that I thought was was really interesting was the development of a transport model to show the fate of these microparticles once they enter the bay and figuring out where they go. And this wasn't just a general transport model. It was actually based on the microparticles that were coming into the bay and the density of those particles. So I wanted to highlight just a couple of images that I think illustrate uh, um, some really interesting points about microparticles in the bay. So this is the modeling result uh, for floating particles, and this is a 15-day model run. Uh, particles were released at four locations in the bay. And what this shows is that these floating microparticles are making it out of the Golden Gate and into the coastal ocean. But there's actually a lot that is staying in the ocean, so the, or in the bay. So these darker colors are the higher concentrations of microparticles. If we look at the sinking particles, um, this, this is um, a, a really stark picture where most of the particles after 15 days are staying within the bay. Very few are making, making it out of the Golden Gate. And so if we think about that 7 trillion microplastic number that's coming into the bay every year, if most of these particles aren't leaving, that means that they are accumulating in the bay. And so I think uh, additional studies in the future of microplastics, it will be really interesting to see if that, if we see that pattern holding where we're seeing this accumulation of microplastics in the bay. This study was also really interesting because there were a number of outlets that, that it produced. So last week in this very room, there was a, a symposium, there is a science report, a, a companion solutions report, there's been a lot of media attention. There are at least 10 journal articles coming out of this work. 
And there's even a film at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival next year. So moving on to the emerging contaminants. Uh, for this group, I wanted to highlight that they, the Emerging Contaminants Work Group developed a tiered risk-based risk framework um, a number of years ago to help prioritize which contaminants they monitor and how frequently those contaminants are monitored. This year, four contaminants were elevated to moderate concern, including imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide um, that's used in over 400 different products, maybe most familiar to a lot of us is Advantage, a spot-on flea treatment. Uh, bisphenols and organic phosphate esters are used in plastic production. Uh, organic phosphate esters, or OPEs, are also used as flame retardants and are the main substitution for PBDEs. And then the fourth uh, contaminant uh, elevated to moderate concern is microplastics. So those first three, imidacloprid, bisphenols, and OPEs, followed a really sort of what I'm going to term a standard trajectory of being elevated to moderate concern. So the uses of those products are, are either stable or increasing. We find them in the bay, and we're finding them at levels that are close to or exceeding toxicity thresholds. Microplastics is a little bit of a different case. Uh, we, don't, we know that it's everywhere, but we don't know very much about its toxicity. And so that would generally put that into the uh, category of possible concern. Uh, but we decided to raise this issue with a microplastics work group, which generated a lot of discussion between the science advisors and the stakeholders, ultimately coming to consensus to raise this to moderate concern, in part because the EU, uh, the European Chemicals Agency, recently decided to, to classify microplastics as a no effects threshold contaminant, which essentially means that they don't think that any amount of microplastics in the environment is a safe amount. And again, that's there, there are a number of reasons why they came to that determination. First, uh, microplastics are everywhere. It seems like every other week, there's a new study that's coming out showing that these microplastics are showing up um, in very remote places. So in the deep sea, at the tops of mountains, they just seem to be everywhere. We know that production of plastics is increasing. Uh, production is expected to double by 2030 under the business as usual scenario. Fragmentation of macroplastic is ongoing, and um, making more microplastic as they fragment. Plastics are persistent. They are nearly impossible to clean up. And again, the impacts on aquatic species are uncertain. So those are the, the litany of reasons why the EU has decided to take this precautionary approach and why we at the RMP have decided to elevate microplastics uh, to moderate concern. So on that sober note, uh, I'm going to move into nutrients and give you some good news, uh, and that is the full bay cruises with USGS will continue uh, for another 12 months. So uh, if some of you may remember last year, Phil highlighted this as one of the challenges for the RMP uh, going forward, and it is still a challenge, so we have a, I would say, a short-term reprieve and um, some stability for the next 12 months. Um, but we still have a longer term challenge and we don't know if the USGS will continue to fund this program in the future. Um, but we are, we are working with our colleagues at the USGS to try to come up with a solution. Um, in terms of the economic impact to the RMP if this program goes away, um, it's a, a 40 plus year data set which really forms the backbone of our nutrients data. Um, and it's about a $600,000 um, additional investment that would be needed to continue this program. So hopefully we are, hopefully the USGS will continue to fund this into the future. Um, the other bit of monitoring um, in the nutrients realm that the RMP supports um, is a, a, a network of um, MORD sensors in South Bay. So we have eight MORD sensors that are continu collecting continuous data uh, on a limited number of parameters. So the Bay Cruise is collecting uh, many more parameters, but only on a, a monthly basis. Uh, from these MORD sensors, we're getting 15, data every 15 minutes um, on, these, on these parameters. And these are really important to inform the biogeochemical modeling that's happening uh, for the Bay, as well as informing dissolved oxygen and primary production discussions in South Bay. Uh, moving on to the PCB workgroup. Uh, this is a, a new project that they're going to be starting in 2020 in Steinberger Slough um, in collaboration with Yao Min Cho and Dick Luthi at Stanford University. And they are going to be deploying these passive samplers that you see here. 
um, to get a sense of the dissolved concentrations of PCBs in the sediment and in the water. And this differs a little bit from the traditional way that PCBs are, are monitored using sediment cores. And the dissolved fraction is generally more, more bioavailable. And so we're getting a better sense of, of what is available to the critters in the system. And again, this is monitoring, uh, can be monitoring in sediment and water and gives us this time integrated um, uh, concentration of PCBs. So we deploy these sensors, we leave them out there for a few months and then collect them. And instead of getting a snapshot, uh, you're getting that time integrated signal. So these will be deployed in Steinberger Slough, which as Tom mentioned earlier, is one of the priority margin units for the RMP. Um, these will be distributed throughout the SLU um, and in two areas where these, the white cylinders are the passive samplers, the yellow cylinders are, are sediment cores. So we'll pair those locations so that we can uh, relate those, the results to each other essentially to see how those methods compare. Uh, for the sediment work group, um, they are currently working on an integrated modeling and monitoring strategy to understand sediment dynamics in the bay. And this is across uh, multiple spatial scales. So looking at sediment coming into the bay from the delta, as well as from the surrounding small watersheds, looking at sediment transport between the sub-embayments, as well as sediment movement from the margins, uh, from the shallows into the margins area. And this work is being done in coordination with a number of other groups and projects in the bay that are all trying to understand what modeling and monitoring is needed uh, to inform adaptation planning and how to habitat restoration. So the Bay RMP is coordinating with the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Program, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, who have uh, developed a, science, a sediment science strategy, as well as the Healthy Waters and Resilient Baylands Project um, that Julie mentioned. Uh, on the selenium side, uh, Bridget actually talked a lot about this program, so I'll just give a very, um, very brief uh, recap of this. This is uh, selenium monitoring in the North Bay to support the TMDL. It's a continuation of the USGS sampling that Robin Stewart has been doing for the last 20, about 20 years. And we're collecting clams in water um, offset from sturgeon tissue. So um, these, you'll notice these are, the, these are the time periods where we're collecting each of these tissues. And they're offset a little bit um, because essentially the sturgeon tissue that we're collecting now in September reflects the clams that they ate in July. Um, so we need that offset for them to incorporate um, what they have eaten into their tissue. Um, so we won't collect any sturgeon tissue during the spawning um, time per period over here, but we will collect clams in water prior to that time period so that we have an indication of what those, what the selenium concentrations are likely to be in their tissues during that sensitive life history stage. All right, and finally, the Sources, Pathways, and Loadings work group. So Alicia gave a great summary of most of the work happening in this work group, but I wanted to highlight the watershed modeling that will be starting in 2020. This is a, a regional, uh, regional watershed model um, that will, uh, similar to how Reed described the, the San Mateo model, incorporate a number of, of regional data sets, including things like meteorology, so rainfall, temperature, wind, water diversions, water releases, uh, the topography of the landscape, as well as land use, um, and, and uh, in the future, the change in land use over time. And then from these data, uh, they'll develop first the hydrological model, and then from there, uh, building on a sediment module that looks at suspended sediment uh, coming into the bay, and then ultimately looking at pollutants of concern that are absorbed onto the sediment. Um, that are being delivered by these watersheds. And this modeling effort, I think, is really interesting. And one of the, one of the really neat things about it is that it crosses multiple work groups in the RMP. And it, it's really an example of how our work groups are, they're no longer, they're not siloed. And many of the projects that are happening in each one are crossing over multiple work groups, I think, which is a, a really good trend to see in the program. Um, this watershed model will also uh, add to additional um, projects that are happening or programs in at SFEI, like the resilient landscapes in the adaptation atlas, as well as the nutrient management strategy and the models that they're developing uh, around nutrients. So that was the whirlwind. 
Um, there are many more projects that are happening, really exciting studies. I haven't even talked about the status and trends work that we're doing, um, but hopefully you all grabbed a pulse on your way in. If you didn't, grab one on the way out. It's also available di digitally if you don't want a copy. Um, but there's a lot of updates in there, both specific to the different pathways, um, as well as general updates in the last section of the pulse. So make sure you grab one of those. So for the last few minutes, I, I want to change gears a little bit and talk about partnerships. Um, partnerships are key to the success of the RMP. Um, I think today has highlighted that uh, very well. And we work with our partners in a number of ways to identify data needs and management, management needs, uh, to ensure that the science we're doing is robust, to develop novel, novel methods, to collect and analyze samples, as well as to communicate the science that we're doing to managers and policymakers. We also partner with a range of entities, uh, from dredgers and dischargers who fund this program, uh, to the regulatory agencies who make this program happen, um, other regional programs, as well as scientists from NGOs, academia, non-regulatory agencies, and analytical labs. And we all celebrate these partnerships, but I think it's important to think about, are there partnerships that we're, that we're not engaged in or that we need to develop more as these ch challenges that many of you have highlighted today, as we look to the future, what are, what are those partnerships that we need to be developing? Uh, climate change is a, a, you know, sort of the framework that we're all talking about today, and I think is, is an issue where we can examine those partnerships. There are a lot of components of climate change that have the, um, the ability to affect water quality. Um, and as the RMP, since that's what we're focused on, um, that's sort of the, the angle that I'm coming at this from. I think that we have a lot of opportunities to advance partnerships um, with SFEI around sea level rise and adaptation planning, uh, with the LTMS around beneficial reuse, um, with the salt based salt ponds as they develop their, their science strategy and their, um, and their restoration plans. Um, with groups like the nutrient management strategy, we can be more integrated to look at, to, um, look at nature based solutions. Um, with other academics and government agencies looking at, that are looking at ocean acidification effects in the coastal ocean and bring some of that learning into the bay. Um, and then, coordinating with programs like the Interagency Ecological Program that are measuring the effects of, of climate change and other stressors on these aquatic species. So I wanted to just give a couple of examples. Uh, so this is building on Julie's presentation and thinking about what are these different strategies for adaptation and thinking about, in particular, so thinking about the multi-benefit solutions, but also, you know, sort of thinking explicitly about what are the water quality benefits of some of these strategies as well. So if we think about a strategy with multiple multiple components here of submerged aquatic vegetation, reef, and 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 beaches, we know that the eelgrass is is good at attenuating waves, but it, it's also a source of dissolved oxygen, which is important uh, for aquatic life. These the nearshore reef, these oysters, uh, they are very efficient at filtering out phytoplankton, potentially harmful algae in the bay. And uh, they also have the ability to mitigate ocean acidification by contributing calcium carbonate to the system. Coarse beaches or, or wetlands or marshes um, using beneficial reuse of sediment, um, that's one, one use, but they can also filter uh, contaminants as they're coming off the landscape before they hit the, before they hit the bay. So thinking about these sort of options in terms of water quality, I think is really important. Um, another piece I wanted to highlight is just thinking about what it means for the bay and water quality, both in terms of sea level rise, but also in terms of increased storminess and what that means, particularly for specific land uses. And here, this uh, figure is showing the industrial areas around the bay. There's around 80 square kilometers of industrial area. 50% of that is within one kilometer of the bay, and 65% of that is within two kilometers of the bay. And so thinking about what happens either if those areas are inundated in terms of water quality, but also sort of the double whammy of flooding of those areas, how does that change, how does that change our, our 
um, our discussion, particularly around adaptation planning. So we think a lot about adaptation planning in terms of protecting communities and protecting uh, critical infrastructure. Um, but what if we need to think about adaptation in terms of making sure that these dirty, dirty land uses don't actually get inundated so that having significant impacts on water quality. So it turns that adaptation a little bit. Um, and just to highlight here, so this figure over here is showing the vulnerability of different areas in the bay, sort of in this bluish purple color. Um, I've highlighted, and this is just to a foot of sea level rise, so expected in the next 10 years. And you'll notice that many of these, these shaded areas overlap with the industrial areas here. So who are the partners that we need to be working with to think about, not to, not to wholesale change what the RMP is doing or what it's about, but how are the projects that we're doing and the data that we're already collecting be used to, to help decide how these challenges are going to be addressed in the future? The work of the RMP has always changed. It's always adapting. Otherwise, we become obsolete. So I think this is just an opportunity to think about what are the future challenges? What are the ways the RMP can develop partnerships to make sure that that we're contributing at the, and the great science that we're doing is contributing to these, these challenges uh, and to create opportunities for the Bay. As Julie mentioned, the challenges in the, that the Bay is facing will not be solved by any one entity. So we really need to work together to figure this out. So I just wanted to end. Um, I'm merely a spokesperson up here today and the credit for all this work um, goes to so many. So the talented team at SFEI, the people who are on our, our committees, our steering committee, our technical review committee, um, our work groups, our science advisors, our partners, um, all of the dischargers who make this program happen. I know these names are too small to read, but I just wanted to put them all in one place to really highlight how many people it takes to make this program happen. So thank you all very much for being here, for contributing to this program, and for making it happen. Fantastic. So, uh, Julie, come on up. Let's, uh, I mean, it was kind of good that you ended kind of talking about adaptation and clean water since we, you know, they, they, they aren't independent issues, but open to, we're open to any, to any kind of question relative to the, uh, you know, the resilient program, R&P, where are we, where we're we going, let it flow. And make sure over here. I know if somebody has a question, it'd be helpful to get your hand up so we can get the mic to you for for smooth transition. Hi, um, I'm Ellen Junk, an RMP founder. So like Jim McGrath and a few others in the room, this is I don't know, thirtieth meeting, something like that. Um, anyway, I've been spearheading uh, quite a few beneficial use of dredge sediment projects around the bay. So I want to get back to this is adaptation monitoring and how the RMP can help further on um, beneficial use. And I want to thank you, Melissa, for you another extolling your virtues on creating and hosting the sediment uh, criteria workshop. On t let's take a look at our 1998 sediment screening criteria and see if what needs to be done to that set to enable greater beneficial use of, of sediment. So um, related to that, one of the ideas that I have out of that is um, the framework for looking at marine sediment and then application to the next environment. Very wet, less than wet. We have 20, how many years of beneficial use as Jim said? starting back to Sonoma Baylands. And we have Cullinan that's been going on. We have Montezuma since you know, the late uh, 90s uh, as well. And th those sites have been monitored. So my question goes to, has the data from that monitoring come into the hands of the RMP? 
and has it been looked at and have you worked with the landowners and the, the folks who have been sponsoring projects that have brought material there to look at how those sites have been functioning, the, any particular ecological risk that has occurred, uh, and how, how that data can be better incorporated into looking at any revisions to the current sediment criteria. Uh, that, that's sort of my, my uh, question and thread. As a way to, to further our thoughts about adaptation and creating more sites and how we can do that. So does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so I'm not aware of any data, monitoring data that has come into the RMP from those projects. I don't, I haven't been here long enough to know the full scope, but I don't, Jay, well, it no, may come to the water board. Answer is yeah. no. Yeah. Well, well, let me, I'm going to have to take this, I'm going to take this on up. You're talking about the a major challenge. That's what you're talking about is data collection in areas outside the footprint of the current core R and P and its funders. So there are lots. To do. So there's an emerging demand to spread our our footprint, whether it be our the work that's coming out of our new sediment work group or interest of what should the this current the Bay R P do in terms of a need for a wetlands R P. There is a wetlands R P project under development, which presumably would be the place where such da existing data sets would be considered and evaluated and the, need, and, and the need for new, better data sets and a regional approach towards data collection and management is happening. So I'll kind of boil down to, though, like where is there sustainable funding to, to enhance the, our needs? We are, you know, we are we're at just south of $4 million for this R&P, as it is, and we have much more needs than we can meet within our existing areas. And so uh, somehow we're going to have to get past that and also, also do it in a matter that doesn't create more silos. We don't want a uh, wetlands regional monitoring program operating independent of the Bay Regional Monitoring Program. We are optimistic that we'll find more, inter uh, more interaction with what work goes on in the Delta, both through the Delta Regional Monitoring Program, which is still still primarily in startup mode, but there's also all the other studies that have been going on through the resource agencies up there. So there's more challenge, unfortunately, than, than our ability to meet them. But we got to keep asking, we got to keep challenging ourselves, like you are doing, Ellen. Okay, so keep it up. Hi, I have a, a question about. Um, it seems in, in looking at the presentations that you gave and, and some of the other ones and some of the restoration projects that, you know, there's really this tremendous opportunity, not only from an environmental and a climate change standpoint, but from a recreation standpoint to build places that people just want to visit. And just keying off the comment around funding and, of course, public support is the key to funding. Um, how, how are, how are, how is SFEI or other um, agencies thinking about uh, bringing the public more into the beautification aspect and translating that maybe into support for some of these programs. I, th I think that's a great question. I think Save the Bay, I think our partners do a lot of that. I think Save the Bay's work in bringing people to the shoreline and um, educate, educating both the public, both corporate groups and everybody about these issues is really important. I think Warner, you probably should have thoughts about how the public has been more engaged. I will say that under Warner's leadership over the last few years, we've had more news coverage than I've ever experienced. I mean, the, you know, I've been at SFEI a long time and we've never, I don't know, never had news coverage before. So having work that, like the microplastic work, um, the RMP work that kind of catches people's attention, um, I think as climate change progresses, we've seen more and more people become interested and want to pay attention. Um, the last thing I'll say before passing it off is that we have also been working on evaluating some of these scenarios that we're talking about for their recreation value. Um, we worked with the Natural Capital Project at Stanford, and they looked at a series of scenarios that came out of the Adaptation Atlas in San Mateo County for, um, they, they took Flickr photos and looked at where people go and trying to get some, you know, people aren't going to be able to access some of the parks that people really like to visit with certain sea level rise conditions. And so 
that's not, it's not super accessible to everybody, but it did highlight the fact that there's a huge recreation value to a lot of the work. Um, so that's my answer to that. Warner, I don't know if you have other thoughts. Well, I'll say just uh, three things. One, uh, you know, SFEI, our job is to provide scientific data to, to decision makers. So we're not an advocacy organization. But I'd say all of these things we're talking about, there's probably three things that are going to occur in the next 12 months that'll range between five to $100 billion in discussions about bringing money to the Bay Area to deal with climate adaptation. Number one is that there's been discussion at the state legislature about a you know, four to five billion dollar bond measure to deal with resiliency issues. And that will probably come up and be discussed. It didn't get, make much progress, but it'll be discussed again in January and February, thinking about a statewide bond measure that'll provide four to five billion dollars statewide. Number two, the state legislature is trying to decide, and they will start in January, having a discussion about what should the state legislature do in the next legislative session to support, incentivize, accelerate local regional climate adaptation planning. There's a recognition that kind of 90% of climate adaptation work is land use planning and 90% of land use planning occurs at the local government level. So the state legislature is thinking about that. And there's a group of people that are talking about trying to put together a coalition of local government, NGO, and other folks to present something to the 27 member state uh, legislative caucus from the Bay Area to tell those 27 legislators, here are the three things that you could do that would support, incentivize, and accelerate the type of local planning that's necessary for doing the planning and implementation and engaging the public in public-based solutions. The third is that the Bay Area Council, SPUR, and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group are shopping an idea around called Faster Bay Area. If you Google Faster Bay Area, faster all caps, that is a $100 billion measure that they want to put on the November ballot to allocate $100 billion specifically for transportation solutions. There's a variety of organizations and environmental organizations and local government officials that are thinking, that's a great idea. Maybe if 5% of that measure was devoted to resiliency, that would be $5 billion dollars that could be made available throughout the Bay Area to do planning, implementation, pilot projects, uh, the type of monitoring that you were talking about so that the other 95 billion in transportation solutions won't be underwater in the year 2070 per the first slide that uh, uh, Julie just made. So those are three big initiatives that are gonna be dealt with in a public dialogue in kind of starting now that could have a huge impact in terms of funding and putting billions of dollars towards the very type of, of challenges and problems we were talking about. Warner, I was thinking more like 10%. Because <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep up with the problems that will be created by all that new transportation infrastructure. But we don't, we don't want to create problems, we want to create solutions. But yeah. The, the spirit of it all is there. But I got a couple other thoughts related to this line of question, this line of thought, because it's what what we get. What's going to take to get the public more involved? The public loves like to recreate, and there's more people are aware of the bay now than historically because we brought it back to to their to them. That we have the Bay Trail, which is a very attractive place for lots of people to recreate, and we actually have parks, a uh, park agencies like particularly like East Bay Park that owns and operates lots of land along the shoreline. They have a lot at stake. They're not they're not in in our funding mix as a partner. So what I what we need is ideas about how do we break down to all these other silos, not just silos within the water the water side of things, that it's the water and land use side of things and engage these folks and that's where we potentially could grow our base from this you know, short of four million to whatever it would what really we're going to need for a true comprehensive regional monitoring program i would say it'd be at least 10 million if, if not 20 million if we really want to generate data to inform billions of dollars of green and not so green infrastructure that if it's not so green it's okay as long as it's environmentally friendly so we got to get the public engaged and so you're all you're all on board, but uh, how do you how, 
we all got to work together in this. Any ideas on funding partners? We're all at us. Good. I wanted. I was going to say, when's somebody from Waterboard staff going to ask a question? <laughs> It's not quite related to water quality, but I was wondering if RMP has any social media presence or any outreach programs. I know at the, as the Water Board, we are trying to initiate our own um, program for that and are thinking about it. But, um, you know, that, that's a <clears throat> accessible way for the new generation to understand these problems and think about it and support it. Yeah, so... Rebecca Sutton has been tweeting all day today <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the RMP. Uh, just for my personal Twitter handle, though. <laughs> RMP does not have a Twitter handle. <laughs> but that's, uh, Tony Hale does some social media stuff for us, uh, but uh, it's not a major part of our work. Um, it That would be not fully funded by the RMP, uh, so it kind of goes to overhead and and the difficulty in, in getting our message out sometimes. We create all these great products, but sometimes it's hard to find that extra uh, resource to get to bring it to an audience that can really use the work. But thinking beyond just the core Bay R&P, which is kind of a theme that's sort of evolved in this discussion now, it's a, if, informatics is one of the, the key skills uh, that, that exist at the Estuary Institute. It's grossly underfunded. Uh, but very, very ambitious and very capable if we can find a way to get sustainable funding. And uh, and that's kind of like the practice as a chicken and the egg kind of thing. So if we can get something up and running, will we have better better engagement by uh, what, the, you know, the private sector? You know, what are the possible private, public private partnerships or get the younger generation more tuned in to how great this bay is and what they can do to be part of making it greater? So. I guess just a couple of more things. So as you saw when you came in, there was a microplastics fact sheet, um, and Becky has been doing a couple of these for the emerging contaminants work, which I think are really useful. Um, I don't know how much the public is engaging with those. We're certainly um, putting those out there for our stakeholders as a more digestible sort of, re you know, sort of recapping of the results of our studies instead of a, you know, a tome of a report or a scientific journal article. Um, the other thing that we're doing this year, that if you have teacher friends, please take note. Um, this is the second year where we're doing a data, data exploration challenge uh, focused on the RMP data, where we're trying to get high schoolers and university students to engage with the, all of the data that we have and to come up with, sort of, to look at the data in a, in a way that maybe we haven't done and to produce visual, visualizations um, that can help us think about how, how do the public want to see this data or what do they think is a useful way to present this data. So those are just a couple of, of other things we're doing, not really on the social media, but trying to, to engage a little bit more. I guess I have one thing to add to this whole discussion, which is that we've started working with Google over the last few years. I am shocked by how much money and in the tech <laughs> industry is not concerned about sea level rise, even, even though Facebook, Oracle, Google, the amount, you know, you've seen those maps. Um, the tech industry, I think, really needs to be more a part of these discussions. They've started something called the Sustainable Business Council or something like that, trying to start to get involved. But I think just sort of as a community, um, we need to hold those tech companies accountable. There's, they use the roads, the buses, the sewer systems. Um, and I've had some conversations with some tech groups who are like, well, I'm outside the blue, you know, I'm outside the field rise zone. Um, and so I think it is an education, um, but I think we need to hold sort of that whole uh, industry accountable. I don't exactly know how to do that, but just putting that out there. Yeah, well, that's definitely we have to work on. Yeah, it also reminds me earlier we talked about needing to address population growth, knowing that's going to happen in the Bay Area, but we also have workforce growth. That's an outgrowth. That's an outgrowth of that's this economy. So a lot there's a lot of people coming into the Bay Area during the day. Which, which either through one way or another, through transportation as well as through their bodies, are contributing to some of our challenges. Uh, uh, so uh, we're about, we're about. Well, it is big part. You should see the nutrient loading that we are now starting to observe during the day. Uh, so uh, 
last slide, we're, as we're wrapping up, I'm going to just make a pitch, as I'm supposed to do anyway before the end, about looking for an email that's going to ask you to complete a survey. And it's really important, as, as you know, any, any time for these things, to get feedback from the audience. One part of that survey, I believe I'm going to say this right, Jay, or mostly, is ideas for the future. Like, because we, like, we, like, what would you like to hear at next year's meeting? What would you like to see in, in, sort of in, in our publications? Somebody want to champion an idea right now? Here's your chance to shout out, but you certainly can do it <laughs> uh, through, uh, through the responding to the survey. So I, I love these things. I mean, I, I don't think I've missed one since the, my arm was twisted by, uh, Michael Carlin on behalf of the Port of Oakland. Um, but oh, I'm, I'm really struck by Julie's work. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by it too. But the picture that she showed of Highway 37 is the microcosm of what we're going to face soonest. The cutting edge of the areas at risk are mostly Caltrans projects. Uh, 101 uh, in, in uh, Santa Mateo and Marin counties. Um, and Highway 37. And uh, it, it's probably no surprise that I would say it's probably not that fruitful to try to engage Caltrans on this, but to engage MTC I think is essential. And, uh, and I think that's something we have to do sooner rather than later because we don't have as much time on transportation facilities as we do on others. And I think like the conservancy with Sonoma Baylands, Laura Marcus had a vision of restoring the whole swath. And it's that vision that captures things. And I think we are developing a vision for Highway 37 that will compel action and will compel funding. So I think it's time to think about how to do that in the context of the RMP, because I think that's where the money will be. I think that's what our economy depends on. I mean, the closure of those roads is just would be devastating to the Bay Area economy. And I think we have to think there's new leadership at MTC. Um, so I'm gonna pose that for next year as to how we're gonna actually move forward and try to solve some of these problems. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would just say, Jim, I, I'm not, I, I have mixed feelings about what you're saying about Caltrans because Cal, there are there are enlightenment. There's a degree of enlightenment at Caltrans that I keep looking for and finding. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> uh, but for example, I was just two nights ago talking to a, a, a senior engineer from Caltrans who works in the district here. Part of the issue is our district, Caltrans District Four, is where it is is extremely progressive compared to Caltrans as a whole, and just you know, kind of just reflect on that because it's the Bay Area. But we were talking about Highway 37, and he made us a pretty direct, profound comment. There is not enough sediment available to do any land-based solution that's being considered for up there. And any, any sediment used for rebuilding the uh, Highway 37 to make it bigger and uh, under this current footprint is sediment that wouldn't be available for for, for habitat protection, so so that's that was coming from somebody from Caltrans. So that's why I I was, I was like prepping him up. You got to take that message and raise it higher, get get it out there, because I don't think others are thinking in those terms. And so good good points, Jim. Okay, well I think that's it, right? Let's call it a wrap. Uh, before you go, I'm going to get River. Please, please do your best to give just even if it's uh, your just a quick response. Any response on the survey is most welcome. I also want to say we are we are essentially adjourning the formal part of the meeting and going to continue the informal part of the meeting, which is obviously a fun, popular way to just keep engaging oh, right across the street here at Jupiter. And uh, it's pretty easy to find because it's just across across Alston. And if you know Trumpet Vine Court, that's the back way into Jupiter, which is it's just down the street to the left, just a little bit. If you go all the way to Shattuck, take a right, and then it's your first right into Jupiter. So uh, my understanding is we are gathering in the uh, in the back patio, the furthest from the bar, but it's still within Jupiter. 
at first any drinks will have to be bought or gotten gotten no, at the we're, bar. No, we're, no, we're, no, we're all good. We're Everything fine. we're gonna get. We have a waiter at the floor. Oh. So we're all okay. Well, then I will go down that. Yeah. You know, so so that's four o'clock. That's that might be time to get over there. Well, thank you all. Great. It's been a great show, and you are my witness.